Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us for Real Life Talks. My name is Yvonne Heath and I am joined today by Sandra Dunham. She is the Executive Director of the Hospice Aurelia Center in, of course, Aurelia. That's yes, it. so welcome Sandra, thank Thanks. you so much. I'm sure you've had a very busy day and uh, it's a little stormy out there, although we have stained glass all around. We're just in this perfect bubble. Uh, I invited Sandra to speak today because as you know, and we've spoken in the past, uh, my, my mission and journey in this life is to have people have the talk about grief, death, and dying long before they are facing it. And uh, in speaking to you the other day, you said something that just makes perfect sense. We need to reframe and not see death as abnormal. Yeah, I think that's really critical, Yvonne, in that um, everybody dies. It's, mm -hmm. it's the inevitable outcome. And of course, it's terrible when it happens earlier. And uh, for the people who are left behind, it's terrible when it happens later. And, and regardless, when, when somebody you love has left you, you feel that terrible sense of loss. Mm -hmm. However, if you also view that you've been cheated or something really strange has happened to you, you've been singled out for an abnormal event, it, it makes the, uh, the grief more complex. So Absolutely. if we start to talk about it and recognize that, yes, one day, I'm not going to be here anymore and, and the people who love me will miss me, mm -hmm. um, then hopefully they can just miss me and focus on that rather than worrying about what went wrong or what shouldn't have happened. Um, or why us or yeah. why did she die so young and you know the, the part of our society and our death phobia is the fact that we do have to see death as a natural end to this journey and we don't all die of old age. No and, and that's the unfortunate thing and you know, certainly I recognize that it's much more difficult, you know, if you lose a child, uh, if you use, lose a parent at a young age, um, you know, we do tend to think of death as something that happens to the elderly, and for the most part it does. Mm -hmm. But certainly there's a lot of people that unfortunately um, uh, die earlier, Absolutely. and and it does happen, and it's not because they've done something terrible, or no. somebody has targeted them, it's uh, in most cases kind of the luck of the draw. Mm -hmm. It is indeed, and of course you've experienced that in your own life with your mom. How old was your mom when she died? So my mother was 43 when mm -hmm. she died, and, and at the time I was 18. Mm -hmm. And so you understand that, of course, you have a grieving process, and you can say, you know, there, I think we have two choices, don't we? You can grieve and then be grateful, like you said, that you had your mom in your life as long as you did, or you can stay in that bitterness and grieve forever. Yeah, and I think largely, you know, when I think about who my mother was, and, and really she devoted um, the first 18 years of my life to me and mm -hmm. my brother, and what she would have wanted, I'm pretty sure, is for us to be competent, well-adjusted adults. Mm -hmm. And so part of honoring the people who go is to really, in my mind, for me, was to yes. honor what they would have wished for you and to appreciate what they gave you in however brief a time it was that, that you were fortunate enough to know them. And you know, it is truly all about reframing it, isn't it? Because you're grateful for how long you had your mom in your life. Absolutely, and you know, don't get me wrong, there are times that I would just dearly love to know. Absolutely. Uh, especially as I get older, like mm -hmm. how it would have been to have that relationship with my mother as an adult. Um, but I don't have that opportunity. That's and right and life is still pretty good mm -hmm. and um, yeah I'm, a, I'm appreciative of, of what she gave me and I've tried to uh, give the same things to my kids. Yes and I think that's a, an extraordinary gift and it's funny because you said your, your kids said I think we talk about death more than anybody but you know we could probably compete with that because I think it's such a gift to your children to your co-workers to everyone your family to normalize these conversations. Yep. And, and, and empower people. Yep. And, and the other thing is, because we have the conversations often, uh, it isn't just about how they manage the grief process, but the chances are fairly high that at one point they'll be asked to um, represent my, I my wishes or to mm -hmm. make, to make uh, healthcare decisions for me. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I would like them to really understand my thought process and be able to do that and very confidently do that and not beat themselves up about did they make the right choices, uh, did they know what I wanted. So even though sometimes they roll their eyes at me and say like, really, do we have to talk about this Again? now? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure one day they'll be eternally grateful that, that I, I did focus on that. 
Absolutely, because the thing is, is that uh, regret is a very painful thing, right? And and I have, I'm sure you have seen it in your career, as so many people that haven't had those conversations and they are so lost. And then you have people with different ideas. Oh my goodness, mom would have wanted this, mom would have wanted that. And then instead of supporting each other in grief, they, this is a fractured family, yeah. which that person who died certainly would not want that. That's right. Yeah. Yes. So what do we need to do? How do we how can we create a culture of change where we normalize these conversations and not live in fear of even just talking about it? Well, I think you have to be prepared to raise it. Sometimes I think it's great to use humor about it, like mm. we, uh, we often do in our family. Mm -hmm. My father r reminds me that he's not going anytime soon because okay. I uh, I do have a power of attorney t for, for his uh, health care needs. And, yes. and so that's kind of a joke. But I'm very confident that when the time comes, I'll know what to do for my dad. Mm -hmm. So I think talking about it, what do you want? What are your values? Mm. Uh, if, you, if you can't say what gives you comfort, what does give you comfort, all of that type <coughs> of dialogue is important. Um, so people can, can make those decisions. But I think it goes beyond just the family. And I think mm -hmm. something that we've really forgotten is that as community, uh, we should be caring for everybody. And that doesn't mean that you have to do everything. But for example, um, if, if you are part of a book club with somebody, and mm -hmm. let's say you have 10 members of the book club, mm -hmm. could you make up a sign-up sheet and every person agree that they would take one day that they'll call that person and ask if they have any needs? Right? It, that's a pretty simple request. Absolutely. And I'm pretty sure most of us for a friend would do that. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, if you, if you have somebody in your life with, let's say, Alzheimer's mm -hmm. disease, then, you know, it's, it's difficult if you're a family member because you become very isolated and people don't know what to do for that person. So let's say you're the church community that that, that person worshipped with for their whole life. Mm -hmm. So make up a, a sign-up sheet. Don't ask people to go for a lifetime. Don't ask people to, to provide all the needs, but say, in this church, could, you, could everybody sign up in the next month to take a 15-minute shift? And could you choose a day and go and visit for 15 minutes and make a note in a journal there that you had a visit and what you did? And, you know, people don't know what to do, but uh, take a Bible and read from it or sure. uh, take a, a letter or a book and, show uh, and read, sh show mm -hmm. up because really that's what matters. And whether or not the person that you visited remembered 10 minutes later that you were there, in the moment you provided peace. And for their family members, I guarantee they will feel better to know that the people that that individual loved when they were well are still in their life and supporting them. And then I would say to people, I have a lot to say. Oh, yes. No, I love this. Um, that when you're well, really mm -hmm. be thinking about who are the people in your life and what gifts could they bring to you? Because I know um, that I would not want to be going and, and physically lifting someone and caring right. for them. That's not for me. It is for other people. Mm -hmm. But I would very gladly go over and bring a meal and sit and eat with a person, right? So yes. um, I think to recognize what are the gifts that you can bring. Uh, the other thing is not to offer in a way that, that makes it easy for somebody to say no, because we're all afraid mm. of imposing. So if you know that somebody that you care for is hurting, it's not what can I do for you. It's I'd love to bring you a meal on Thursday. How mm. would that suit you? I love is it. Is there anything you don't eat, mm -hmm. right? We just we have lost the practice of helping one another oh my and, goodness. and if we are going to get through the next 20 years yes. we have to pick up that gauntlet and run with it i oh it's just like music to my ears because as you know i say it takes a village to support the ill the caregiver the dying the bereaved and each other and i think people are really compassionate they just don't know what to do and and so they tend to back away i don't know what to do i don't know what to say and if they can't fix it or they can't commit to hours and hours or do the heavy lifting they think, well, I can't do anything. That's There's right. always something you can do. And sometimes a 15 minute yep. visit can can light up someone's life. Yep. And that's so important. Yep. And often the dialogue we have is we'll say, oh, I heard, you know, I heard you're sick. Is there anything I can do for you? Mm. And for the person who's sick, they're completely overwhelmed. Yes. And, and they can't really think in the it. moment, they don't yep. know what they need. Mm. So that's where we get back to. Could you give them a call? Could you arrange for there to be a group of people and, and, you know, one person says, I'll call every Monday. So Monday at noon, you call. How's your day going? So you've broken sort of the monotony of the day. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you need today? And, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you were ill to know that somebody was going to offer just for today? You don't so have wonderful. to say, I want it forever. Um, so 
it, you know, and if it's not something you can offer, you would know who, who might be able to help sure. with that. Yes, I think the other side of that too is we uh, we seem to think we're heroes if we don't ask or oh you know no it's okay I don't need yeah. anything but meanwhile you know we we sometimes suffer in silos of isolation yeah. and we need to be okay because I've said to people I said oh well I hate to ask I don't want to impose I spoke to um, a woman whose husband died and uh, she said the best piece of advice that mm. she ever got through the whole process was to never say no to an offer of help. So she said, you know, even though I could still cook and mm -hmm. enjoyed cooking, if somebody offered to bring a meal, I always said yes, because I was told to. Yeah. And in the end, it was because you said yes that people kept offering. Exactly. Because the other side of the equation is if we have the dialogue and you say, oh, I don't know what I need, what I may have heard is, I have other people who are going to help me and, mm -hmm. and you're intruding on my time. Right. And so, you know, that probably is the farthest thing from the truth. So we have to think about how we frame the ask, ask the offer, right. and, and then also how do we frame the what you can do for me. So even if, you know, in the case I really enjoy cooking, you might say, I really enjoy cooking, but I'd love company. Mm -hmm. So I'd love it for now if you'd come and join us for a meal. And later on, maybe I'll ask you to cook for me. So I would love someone to cook for me. <laughs> okay. <Letting you> know. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm just like, oh, I wish people, yeah. And I, I, I'm going to say yes, absolutely. Please, everybody cook for me. And then come and sit with me. And and we need to be okay with asking. And we need to be, you know, we don't have to feel like if, if we ask, we're kind of hoping they kind of say no. You know, we are compassionate and we can be that village and yep. show up for each other. And you know, places like Hospice Aurelia and Hospice Palliative Care, that is wonderful, but we still, with hospice and with palliative care, we still need our community. Absolutely, and, and you know what? Um, there are fabulous caring professionals mm -hmm. and there are wonderful volunteers and they support uh, people who are dying through the whole mm -hmm. range from first early diagnosis right through to the grief and bereavement. However, let me say that the people that I have been with my whole life are my favorite people. Right. And why wouldn't I want to have them That's around me? That's who you me? want there as well. Yeah. And that is a perfect way to end our segment, which happens so quickly. And I thank you so much for being here because it is a really important conversation. We can empower each other. We can have these conversations. We can learn to ask, say yes to those meals, and, and show up for your neighbor. Ask. How can I help? What can I do today? Even if you have 15 minutes, that could make their entire day, couldn't it? That's it. That's it. Thank, Thank you Yvonne. so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And next we'll have uh, Michael Jones. He'll uh, tell us a little bit about his journey, his life. Uh, back in a bit. Welcome back, everyone. I have with me now Michael Jones. Hello, Michael. Hi. So, Michael, we're going to lighten it up a little. We were talking about grief and death and end of life, which is an important topic, but now we're just going to talk about living life to the fullest. 
Michael Jones is a leadership educator, author, Juno-nominated pianist, composer. His most recent book, The Soul of Place, Reimagining Leadership Through Nature, Art, and Community, is the third in a series asking how leaders can reimagine places as living systems inspired by nature, art, community, and our deepening humanity. <gasps> I love huh. that, Michael. So welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Great to be with you. And I have to tell you that I listened to your TED Talk, mm -hmm. and um, we're going to talk a bit about that because it was 18 minutes, wasn't it? Yeah. It took me an hour. Precisely. To, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes, right to the team. It took me an hour to get through it because you kept saying these incredible lines. I said, oh, that's, uh. I had to pause <laughs> and write this down. And uh, one of them, and we spoke about the fact that uh, you shared a story, and I love the story. I'm going to share it today. Who's going to play your music if you don't play it yourself? So tell me about that and what that means to you. Sure, yeah. You know, I had an experience once when we were traveling. We found our way to a place on the West Coast, mm -hmm. on the Pacific Coast in California. It was an educational center. And I had a couple of recordings out at that point. And mm -hmm. we were traveling around, kind of finding where our true home might be. And uh, so we settled in there for a bit of time to take some courses. And there was a little upright piano in the dining room. Occasionally, I would go over and play. Mm -hmm. And one evening after I started playing, a young man came up, sat down beside me. And uh, I was just about to get up and leave, and he said, excuse me, before you go, I just had something I wanted to share with you. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, we've been listening to you play, and uh, my friends and I have been thinking, you know, we really enjoy what you're doing, but there's only one problem. You sound an awful lot like Michael Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And you have to develop your own style. Yeah. <laughs> Giving you some good advice, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Yes. Don't plagiarize. And then he yes. started lecturing me. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. About how you have to find your own voice. Oh, that's hilarious. And, and uh, I finally said, look, I am actually, I might be the person you're talking about. Right. He looked at me for the longest time. He said, no, you're not. He didn't believe you. Oh, <laughs> no. that's just so hilarious. And it was, a, it was really a telling moment for me because... Um, for one thing, it wouldn't probably have happened in Canada. We're not, we're not bold, it's so bold that we walk up to people right. and sort of lecture them about who they're supposed <laughs> to sound like, you yeah. know. But, uh, but I think it was also telling for me in terms of recognizing that I had found something which was distinctive on my own as mm -hmm. I moved into recording my music and realized what a gift that was. Because I think if you read artist biographies, you spend a lot of your life trying to find out who you, who you are, you mm -hmm. know, what do you uniquely sound like, what your signature is. Right. And so the story you saw in the TED Talk, I think, was essentially the call to find my own voice. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I was very insecure about my own music for a lot of years. I'd studied classical music for years, and the music I played never quite measured up to Chopin or Beethoven or anybody else. Um, but I did do cover arrangements of popular tunes. Mm -hmm. And one night I was at the Prince of Wales Hotel for a week working a group with a group of managers. And we had an evening off, and I came back early to prepare some material for the next day. And there's a little spin at piano by the front desk. So I sat down, started playing, and of course, just doing cover arrangements of popular tunes. Right. But the, it was off season. The hotel was empty aside from our group, to my knowledge. So I wove a little of my own music into it. And, uh, and after a while of doing this, probably about 30 minutes, an older gentleman started to appear out of the down the hall, mm -hmm. the glass of red wine, red wine, mm -hmm. <laughs> precariously perched between his thumb and his forefinger, mm -hmm. kind of weaving towards the piano. And I said, oh, no, you know, here we go. <laughs> uh -oh. He's going to yeah. be asking for things I don't know how to right. play. Right, yes. <laughs> and it's just going to generally be uncomfortable. On he came, you know, he fell into the easy chair beside the piano, listened as I played. And when I finished, he said, excuse me, if you don't mind me asking, what music was that? And I said, I think it was probably a little bit of Moon River. Thought about that and said, no, that's not what drew me out here. There was something else I didn't recognize. What was that? And I said, well, that is probably a little bit of my own music, I said. Ah, he said, okay. Could you play more of that music for me? Not Moon River, but mm -hmm. that music. And I was stunned. Here was a stranger coming out of nowhere asking me to play my music. Right. And so I did, you know, for about 10 or 15 minutes. Because once I get started, it's hard to stop, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> And he said, and when I finished, he said, that's quite lovely. I don't know why you're bothering with Moon River if you can play this. Mm. And I became quite defensive. I said, well, it's Moon River. People want to hear. They don't want to hear me. Right. And he said, well, I think, I think maybe they do. And then he got curious. He said, do you work here at the hotel? And I said, oh, no, no. I'm an organizational consultant, leadership educator. I'm busy changing the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he didn't look at all impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's nice. So anyways, yeah, yeah. anyway. Yeah, anyway, let's get yeah, back to the uh -huh. real story yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, 
And so he, uh, and then he got really curious again. He said, well, how many other people do this work that you do? And I said, well, probably about 20 or 30 in the Toronto area. Mm -hmm. Then there was a long pause. And I remember most of that moment was how clear and almost fiery his eyes were. And he said, well, who's going to play your music if you don't play it yourself? Mm. And it was just it's a like question <gasps> to uh -huh oh, moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was stunned. You know, yes. I was, look, I'm a teacher. I'm supposed to have answers to questions, but right. I had no answer to that you question. Didn't. I realized friends have been asking me that for years, and I kept putting it off. And, and he stood up, put his hand on my shoulder. He said, this is your gift. He said, don't waste it. And, wow. And, uh, and then turned kind of unsteadily, picked up his wine and kind <laughs> of headed off. And I sat on the piano bench stunned by the question because mm -hmm. I realized I couldn't live the life I'd been living in the face of having been asked the question. And I think we have often those what you may call crucible moments. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking of living, you know, death and dying, in some way, we almost have to live our dying every day, I think. Because he was kind of issuing a call that I had to give up some part of the work I was doing. Mm. Because I was doing a session on vision and purpose for the group the next morning. It's about, you know, their, their vision for their business for themselves. Right. So it's all coming out of a textbook. <laughs> I realize it's not coming out of my own lived experience. Interesting. And so I couldn't teach it. Mm. You know, I, I did it, but I didn't feel at all authentic. And so, and so not too long after that, I, I didn't play Moon River after <laughs> that Right. Night. He called and you to be fear. your authentic self, didn't yeah. he? Yes, your Yeah, I mean, I voice. did go in search of him down in the, in the lounge yeah. to see if yes. we might never maybe saw him again. reframe the question, you know. Yes. Maybe I could do it on weekends or something. <laughs> yeah. He was nowhere to be found. It's mm -hmm. interesting. A colleague says, it's interesting how angels come to us, you know. Absolutely. Form of drunks and <laughs> <laughs> children. <laughs> it's true, but, you know, the messages come if we're ready to hear, you know, and, and really listen. Yeah, and I and think so I was listened. at a point. I was in midlife. Mm -hmm. And I think I was at a point where I really was realizing I had to listen into sort of what the, what's the next half of my life gonna gonna be. Right. So how did that change? How did things change for you? Well, I did record a 90-minute cassette of my own music. Mm -hmm. um, some months after that, I realized there was a lot more music that was sort of music I created out of my own imagination. And I was doing these seminars, and after, after hours I would play. A few people came later on that evening and listened to me as I was playing that piano and. You know, they were asking about the music and said, if you ever record anything, could we get a copy? Mm -hmm. So I had a list. <laughs> I also bought a grand piano and I had an accountant who said, you better find a way of writing this off. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to yeah. find a way to pay for it. Absolutely. And so that was another kind of financial incentive. But right. I was also inspired by this piano to do something. So one day I just, with a recording engineer, sat down just played for 90 minutes. He had 90 minutes of tape. Wow. I just played beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Didn't think anybody would hear it other than a few neighbors. So I didn't, didn't even, I wasn't even nervous. I was, just played. I didn't even edit. <laughs> you just played from I your just heart. just played straight through. Mm -hmm. And it became Piano Scapes. It was called Michael's Music. I didn't know what else to call it. And then I called it Piano Scapes because it was really just a kind of a soundtrack, I think, that people could put on to, for their own lives. And okay. people related to it. It wasn't sort of like a set of songs. Right. Were set list. Some of the pieces were 15 minutes or so, and I just offered a breathing moment and then mm -hmm. carried on. But so you just play. You just allow whatever comes Just was out. in the yes. flow of it, yeah. Yes. I just thought this is, this is just a delightful. You yes. know, the, the next one I did, I suddenly, then I had an audience, then I got nervous, <laughs> and then I had to edit mm -hmm. because it was hard to get a, a, a clean recording. Sure. Uh, so that was, I realized how special that, that moment had been to capture the music so spontaneously. That's wonderful. Uh, but that opened up. I think I've done about 15 recordings since then and, and several books. And I think the books came out of the same question, really, because mm -hmm. I realized the music is a metaphor for sort of who's going to play your life if you don't play it yes. yourself. And your life can take on many different uh, nuances or different, you know, move from, from music to writing to teaching to speaking to... It's Eldering. amazing. Wow. <laughs> and but you you've woven your gifts into what you teach in leadership. Yeah, one correct? thing's just kind of built on the other. Yes. Uh, I had done a lot of leadership education work, but the music was not was not part of it at that time. And I often felt I've left the most important part of myself, the part I've enjoyed being with the mm -hmm. most, was out in the parking lot. Right. Because it wasn't welcomed in, you know. And then when I did get the invitation to bring <clears throat> the music in, that added a whole other dimension. 
Yes. <coughs> to it at that point. That's such an important message, and I think it is our, mm -hmm. the most important message is, you know, what is your gift? What is your truly authentic passion? Yeah. And, and weave it, you know, don't leave it in the parking lot. Weave it into whatever else you are doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you can create, it can be your living, how wonderful, but at least weave it into everything else you, you do because that's your gift. It is really, and, mm -hmm. and you have to kind of live a different kind of life when you're living your gifted life. I think it's more a life lived by the light of a candle rather than a flashlight. And I um, love that. That was one of my, <laughs> I had to pause and write and say, yeah. yes, travel with a candle rather than a flashlight, you know, and, and, and light things up as you go along. And you also had said, close your eyes when you wanted people to hear the music, just close your eyes or soften your vision. Uh -huh. Sometimes we just need to soften our vision. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Because what you're, what you're searching for is somewhat opaque. It doesn't come in it like a burning bush. It's much more right. subtle. And you need a different kind of light, I think. In order yeah. To, in order you have to so many it. inspirational things you say and, and how you lead. And I would love to, uh, you, you are leading, uh, teaching leadership and uh, throughout the states and different places, mm -hmm. aren't you? Yes, mm -hmm. but you you do bring them that message of how important it is to, do you tell them, find your own gifts and your own, you know, find the way to play your own music? That's one of the messages, certainly. I think it's an important one. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and to be open to the, the way it comes, because often it will come through a stranger. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, my friends were all quick to discourage me. So, you, Michael, you're not that good. Oh, <laughs> you know? very nice. I think Thank they're just wanting they're protective. You know, they didn't want me to be sure. disappointed, and, right. and they sort of had had to find me in a particular way. Yes. In terms of the work I was doing, so I realized I had to kind of be present or available to get the message from an unlikely source, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the, one of the most unlikely sources <laughs> was an older gentleman kind of appearing out of nowhere. But I think the community, in a sense, listen. calls the gift out for us. Absolutely. Because the gifts lived in service of the community. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we just so caught up, get co so caught up with our own sense of. And I think everyone should listen to your TED Talk and uh, look at your website and see your books. And I look forward to reading one of your books or all of them. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today. Great. I Thanks really so much. appreciate it. And we're going to talk you into playing the piano later, just so you know. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks for joining us, everyone. And as always, my advice to you is, I'll stop the beeper, plan your life, plan your death, and then just love your life to death. And always bring your own tambourine to the party. Thanks again. Bye for now.